in the in the library that uh, were available, and I'm going to complain about the fact that I think uh, that some of the great architects of this time should have, you know, we should have several copies, and some of them should be kept in the in the library so they can be used anytime. And I had a, I said this last year because a Chinese student that came with the same problem. He was looking for. Uh, uh, Steve's uh, books and uh, the various books and all that, and there was nothing available. So I kind of, as a last minute resource, I recommended him a French magazine that some years ago was dedicated to their work, and he was kind of out of the book, but really I think uh, we should solve that problem. No problem. Uh, you should have asked me. Well, uh, he <laughs> called me yesterday, <laughs> and still yeah, 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 very yeah, last yeah. minute. These are not, uh, I don't think they are in the library yet. This one at least is. Uh, yeah, it isn't yeah. Oh, it's a it private. It isn't private. Okay, yeah. well. Pass it around. Um, but um, nevertheless, and, and even if you haven't been, um, or if you're not that acquainted of, of Steve's uh, office work, I think uh, you must have many questions as American architects. I mean, uh, you know, I'm kind of an outsider, and uh, I've read them, their work, you know, for, for many years being far away. Uh, that was a kind of a different approach. I, I didn't know your culture much, so I had to make, you know, kind of a get into a different mood. But, but I think as American architects, you must have all sorts of questions, because it's, it's not only, I think, the intellectual quality of the work that, that um, their office has been doing, but also the, the, the experience of work that they can share with you today. So uh, this is your opportunity to feel free to answer whatever questions. And if you don't, if you want to get into a mood, maybe you have something already prepared. So we can start with something you prefer. And then, you know, What did you decide to study Las Vegas and not any other Well, it was just, it, it wasn't because Las Vegas, it was Las Vegas, really. It was because, you know, we were interested in studying decoration and representation and symbolism. And that led you to commercial architecture because it was the only place, other than historical architecture, where you could study that, those kind of techniques. And if you're looking for the most extreme, commercial environment in the United States, at least in the 60s, it was Las Vegas. So, it was, you know, so it wasn't anything, anything particular about Las Vegas other than it was an extreme example of a commercial strip, automobile strip. There's no, uh, I mean, we weren't terribly interested in gambling or, you know, any of what Las Vegas is, is about on a lot of levels. Every project that you do, um, it's a follow-up of Las yeah. Vegas. Yeah, the, the techniques and the, the kind of systematic investigation of context. Um, and because, you know, the learning from Las Vegas thing really had a lot more to do with Denise than it did with um, Bob. You know, the methodology of it is a, is a planning, an urban design methodology out of the 60s that was kind of prevalent at places like Penn and Harvard. And so it... You know, it, it really uh, is something that we do in a shorthand version for, you know, almost anything that we're working on beyond the scale of a single building. Don't do it that much. But, yeah, you know, the, the issues, the kind of methodology of it, putting things in a larger context, culturally, economically, politically, all of that is, uh, you know, something that we're kind of interested in and, and we tend to do. But that's Denise's influence more than anything else. So, I mean, does that mean that you follow that influence, or...? Yeah, I mean, I've been, that's, you know, what I've been doing for 20 years. I mean, you know, I, you know, starting out with Las Vegas. So it's, it's something that most everybody in the office is pretty much internalized. I mean, not as a, I mean, you don't do it that often as a, 
formal process because one, you don't have budgets, you don't have clients and it could afford the time to do that kind of investment mm -hmm. in, you know, invest. But we, you know, we've done a series of other studios modeled on Las Vegas in the last 20 years. There was the Levittown studio that came right after Las Vegas. Then in the 70s, I did a big one on Atlantic City, looking at the whole idea of historical resorts modeled almost directly on the, that was done with the University of Pennsylvania students. Uh, Denise and I did another one on the idea of parks and recreation in Philadelphia with Penn students in the early 80s. So <coughs> there's been a series of other, they're almost always done in a full-blown way in schools because it's the only place you have the slave labor to really do, you know, one of those investigations. <laughs> there's no paying clients anymore that pay for that kind of stuff, you know, in terms of, I mean, even when she does kind of her more traditional urban design studies for um, communities, they're done in a much more shorthand version. But yeah, they're structured kind of like the Vegas, because you just don't have paying clients that can pay for those kind of hours that go into the kind of research that went into something like Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, in learning from Las Vegas, uh, you remarked a lot the use of advertisement. Uh, if we talk in terms of, in terms of architecture, uh, probably that is not architecture, and it just is, it's just hype. What do you think about it? No, I mean, I, the difference between architecture, I mean, hype can be anything. I mean, hype doesn't have to do with, remember, well, on one level you're right. I mean, you could say the medium is the message, and by therefore, by metaphor, by analogy, you'd say that, you know, if you're dealing with a medium, which is basically hype, which is advertising, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of truth to what you're saying. But, I mean, whether that's a negative all the time is a question of context and the situation, you know. I mean, in other words, I mean, if we'd put a big sign that said art on the National Gallery, that would have been inappropriate, right? We didn't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not that we haven't come up with schemes for art museums that did have big signs that said art, you know. I mean, for a certain kind of, but it wasn't appropriate on Trafalgar Square in London, you know, for the, uh, the National Museum. So I, so it's a question of context and, and, and appropriateness. It isn't a question of whether it's hype or not. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with hype when it's in the right place. I mean, hype on a strip is perfectly the natural response because all you're doing is selling, see? I mean, so I, whereas hype in uh, somebody's house might be totally inappropriate or in a national museum might be totally inappropriate. So just because you look at Las Vegas doesn't mean that you go and do, quote, do Las Vegas every place if it's inappropriate. Uh, and, and nobody would ever said that. I mean, you know, and in fact, it's been years, you know, in all the years since Las Vegas, what, we've done maybe three commercial buildings that you could say, oh, you know, and, and a few competitions which are obviously connected to Las Vegas ideas that were never built. But, you know, everything else we do, university work, things like that, has nothing to do with Las Vegas. You know, totally irrelevant. Um, wouldn't pretend that it did. I mean, that, that which points up a fallacy with a lot of architectural theorizing. A lot of architects come up with a theory, and then any project they get, they apply it to. You know, I mean, what we were saying is, you know, we're coming up with a, an understanding about commercial architecture. If we're not doing commercial architecture, we're not doing this. You know, I mean, you know, to get, you know, it's irrelevant. You know, I'm not going to do a house that's Las Vegas, or, or et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So it's a question of appropriateness. <coughs> so you come up with another theory for the other thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you think, you know, you have to come up with a different idea. Well, when I was reading in the magazine, um, I came up with this kind of a question. It says, um, I'm asking, how do you see your aesthetics based on this quote? People have taken Venturians to task, supposedly being the delinquent herald of commercial aesthetics, the architects of the site majority of the scorn middle class. Uh, I don't know. I. I never know how to react to those things. It's, it, it, it seems, um, I mean, the point of fact, look, we're dealing in a complex culture that has upper class, you know, you can put class designations on it, you can put taste culture designations on it, you know, it's, you can put all these different ways of, um, yes. gotta get playing? 
You take the pepperoni. Uh, <laughs> see there, that's why my point. So you're playing in pepperoni. <laughs> the, uh, and so I so um, so the point is that we're not we're not trying to you know purport to represent anybody. But what we are saying is that you know architects have clients, whether they're paying clients or or you know theoretical users or whatever and 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 one should try make some attempt uh, to kind of understand their taste and their values doesn't mean I have to sympathize with it totally or not you know I mean I, uh, but on the other hand if I'm going to take it if, if I totally don't well then I better not take the commission right I mean because it wouldn't be fair I mean uh, on the other hand if I can understand it and whether I want to live that way, particularly myself, and it isn't killing somebody or something, you know, I might be willing to put my skill to use to articulate somebody else's values. Any architect who's working for anybody but himself is going to have to do that to some extent, right? I mean, <laughs> so I don't, you know, <laughs> so at that point, it, I don't know what the, I don't see that as a criticism, that just seems to me is, Trying to sensitize yourself to the situation you're in and the people you're working with or for. I've got a question. Mm. Doing the questions or? No, 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 no. I don't. You talked a little about client and different having a client who has a different viewpoint about architecture. How do you? What do you think about um, a client who is uneducated about architecture and what the best way to go about? convincing them and educating them that your philosophy is, the, is a good philosophy. I wish I knew. Is there, is there no easy way? No. We're not very good at it, <laughs> put it bluntly. I mean, if you look at our job development <laughs> battering average in the last couple of years, we're unbelievably stink of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, On one level, forgetting ideas for a minute, people buy architects like they buy anything. I mean, they they tend to hire architects that are themselves to some extent. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just human nature. I mean, people tend to feel comfortable with people that kind of you know represent their values, and somehow you know, on a very subjective level, they feel <coughs> they have some identification with. Um, um, we're a bunch of relatively weird workaholics, you know, who kind of spend all our time doing this stuff. I mean, so our client group is very narrow. <laughs> you know, it appears to be very narrow. It's never, it's always been extremely difficult for the firm to get work. That tends I mean, to happen automatically, though. You track the client who you automatically agree with. And automatically there's some proof to that because it's certainly. I was in the last few years when the economy got so bad. We're out marking like crazy, like everybody else, trying to get work, right? I mean, and you're kind of pushing yourself on people. In other words, you're trying to do proactive rather than, you know, reactive marketing. And the trouble with proactive marketing is you have to sell yourself to somebody. Reactive marketing, obviously, somebody's already convinced they're coming to you, right? I mean, there's something that appeals to you on some level that they, you know, they phoned or sent you a letter. Uh, so right off, you've had a pre-selection. Um, and that's the only way. Our proactive marketing ability is like absolutely sub 100, I mean, as far as I can see. I mean, we just are totally unable to, you know, convince people to like us <laughs> or to want us. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, if there's some interest, we're not that bad at, you know, building on that. But I have a feeling, in other words, we're lousy salesmen as architects. Um, and if our ideas don't sell us and some of our architecture, then forget it, all the talk in the world ain't going to get us the job. <laughs> you know, and it, but that's probably, whereas there's other guys, you know, like a Bob Stern or something, a guy's obviously, or a Philip Johnson, like the wizard salesmen of the 20th century. I mean, they can sell, you know, Edsel's, I don't know. You know, they can sell anything. I mean, <laughs> they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I mean, that's the proof of it is what they build, you know, is what they sell. So, so, you know, so what can I tell you other than some people are good salesmen and other people are good architects? I don't know. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh, you did the, the uh, learning from Las Vegas about Las Vegas from the 70s. 
60s, the culture has changed quite a bit since then and changes every day. How do your theories reflect that change or these changes? You don't have that article? <laughs> no, I'm really looking, yeah. I don't know. Um, It's not really a theory, so it doesn't have to change. Remember, all it was was a theory. The difference between a theory and what we did, a theory is supposed to be some generalized principle that can be replicated, right? That, you know, you can state a series of principles and replicate them and get the same result, I mean, from a scientific point of view. And there's almost nothing in architecture that's that way, as far as I've ever been able to see. So the word theory right away is probably a tolerable misnomer to use in architecture. All it was was a methodology of trying to understand a complex situation or, you know, and in that sense, it automatically changes. If I look at a different situation, I'm going to come up with a different set of, you know, parameters. Um, so, in that sense, it doesn't, I don't, I don't have to worry about it, see. I mean, it's just, whatever the next, probably, if I'm dealing with Trafalgar Square in London, well, then that generates another set of priorities, ideas, conditions, whatever you want to call them, quote, another theory. Um, Do you and the process is kind of similar, you know, the, of the analysis, yeah. but the, but I don't think it, it shouldn't, by our definition, generate the same result, otherwise there's something wrong with it. Has there been another city that you're looking at studying, as you do Las Vegas? I wanted to go back to Las Vegas this year and do a relearning from it. Couldn't get it funded. Couldn't get it funded the first time because it was, you know, totally off the wall, right? And now I can't get it funded this time because it's totally old hat. <laughs> can't win at all. I think it is. You know, yesterday we were late with some former family we were having with them, the landscape people, and I think it's a pity you will leave without showing those findings and the things you were doing. I really regret that because you won't talk about that today. No, tonight, I mean, this afternoon I was going to talk about competitions, but just because I thought we've been doing the most of the last six months is a whole series of crazy ass, you know, I mean, a new, another competition every two weeks. I mean, it's just been like the worst series of sketch problems in a run. Totally burned out charrettes one after the other. Did you come here to recuperate? Yeah, I come here to recuperate. Yeah. Uh, I have something uh, which uh, might be connected to a case study of the city. We, of course, are aware that we have a special place here, which is called Columbus, Indiana. And if I may, let me, just for the benefit of everybody, read a few statements. Uh, Columbus, Indiana is a cultural treasure. Set in the flat Midwestern countryside, the town is world renowned as an exemplar of the best in urban design. Listen to that. The town filled with exceptional contemporary buildings and carefully restored historic ones. One does not expect such a phenomenon in such a small rural town in Indiana, far removed from the supposed intellectual and artistic centers of the country, such as New York or Chicago. Yet, there it is. How did this happen? What set Columbus apart from other towns of like size and industry in Indiana or in any state? Uh, yeah, how about this, what, what, what we might like to call the essence of the Indiana cornfields. They had a logo for some time, it was called the essence of the prairie, but you know, everybody who grew up here remembers this was never really a prairie, it was a wooded area, so they don't, Until they, they don't cut it, yeah, right. <laughs> Until they cut it down to make farm yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I think I, I, made, this, I made this up here. Columbus, the, uh, the essence uh, in the Indiana cornfields. As far as our college is concerned here, the founding dean of our college, Charlie Seppenfield, uh, calls Columbus has been a constant source of inspiration to our students, faculty, and public since our college's beginning in 1965. 
the college and university have honored J. Irvin Miller with an honorary doctorate for his contributions to designing Jana and the world. And as far as for those who are not familiar with this, uh, uh, Columbus, more than 60 buildings designed by internationally recognized architects, including the distinguished firm of, uh, uh, of uh, Steve's. Um, during the last 50 years are well known and attract annually more than 60,000 visitors who take the architectural tour. The importance of community, community leader Urban Miller in stimulating the involvement of world-class architects through this guidance and generosity, through his guidance and generosity, is recognized. But other historic forces and the special community spirit are at work to create a small town environment and community life which is clearly superior to that of other towns of comparable size. You want to hear some more? Advertisement about them? Or yes, no. you got it. You got it. No. Well, we can you talk a lot right? about uh, what's so special. Let me hear, hear Dr. Preiser from, from the University of Cincinnati. Let me just add uh, uh, something like here. Columbus, indeed, represents a unique case in the United States in that a number of public buildings, as well as commercial and other important structures, have been designed by world famous architects, the impact of which is not lost on the tourist industry or community. And uh, yes, I have a couple of other quotes right here, but uh, maybe there is an opportunity to quote this later. My question to Steve is uh, uh, something about, let's call it the interrelationship between, let's call it community health, and, and the and environment, the quality of environmental design, of architecture, landscape architecture, planning, and related issues, which is very timely, because uh, Venturi's number four fire station was one of the first buildings which indeed got international attention by the architectural press. Uh, yeah, but not in Columbus. Uh, presently, uh, yeah, yeah, it wasn't even on the tour for years. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank frankly, you. the building has a lot of problems, uh, you know, uh, but uh, in terms of building technology and otherwise. But uh, that's not the point I wanted to make. The other one is, of course, presently, presently, Steve is traveling once in a while to Columbus. To, and you might just start to, uh, with that particular project. And the general question is your comments, and you might like to follow up on this on what makes Columbus special, and indeed, uh, how do you feel it ranks, let's call it, in the history of architecture during the last 50 years? Not very high. Um, is <laughs> the answer to that. Look, I mean, for Columbus, is it really. You know, I don't want to be too negative about Columbus. They're our client, right. but the, uh, right. but, uh, and you know, we're having working on an interesting problem there. I mean, which is kind of a generic problem of most smaller cities of you know how you connect uh, downtown to the interstate, basically, and how you create civic identity on the interstate, how you market yourself on an interstate so people spend some money in your town, whizzing on by, which is very prototypical problem, you know, for 90% of the country. The, um, so on that level, and it's, and it's an interesting place to work because there is this kind of atmosphere of, you could almost call it pretension for excellence, you know, that they are interested in, quote, good design. The downside to Columbus for years has obviously been that it was a fiefdom of, <laughs> you know, one guy for all intents and purposes and his taste. I mean, you know, so that and any time you do that in any urban environment, it seems to me you're courting disaster because what you're going to get is a uniformity that isn't necessarily, in a lot of ways, Muncie's a hell of a lot more interesting than Columbus, you know, ragtag, everything else. Uh, just because Columbus has got this pretensions to take, quote, good taste. And good taste never did much good for most places that I can see in American cities. So, so there's a, <coughs> so I have a basic problem with, and, you know, and just look at what he did. I mean, you know, right, he got a few interesting build. He got some great buildings in the 40s when he went to the Saarinen's, right? Um, and then for 25 years, he built, hired a bunch of corporate architects and built a bunch of stuff that could be in any suburban office park in the U.S., you know, and it isn't very good. And it ain't going to ever make it on any 
architectural map any place. It's pretty shitty if you want to know the truth. Uh, and yeah, I mean that's the truth. I mean just look around. You know, so there's a few great early buildings, uh, and and then a lot of stuff that's really pretty damn uninteresting. You know, it's just corporate architecture. Because he and and but what did he do? He hired the guys he felt he was a corporate guy who hired the guys he felt comfortable with. My point earlier, you know, and and anytime you get locked into that, you're in trouble. Now, interestingly, you know, as we'll see what happens with the next guy, you know, because now Will Miller Jr. is you know taking over the reins of the thing. Much younger guy, a Vince Scully student, you know, from Yale and and the whole thing and. I think he kind of, you know, there's some beginning to be a reaction. To that. I mean, the mere fact that we're back in town after 25 years is, you know, it tells you one thing, because, you know, the old man would never let us back in town. I mean, he hated that <laughs> fire station. I mean, he figured he, that was the biggest mistake of his life, I have a feeling. <laughs> so the mere fact that we're back in town shows that there's some generational shift, you know, um, in the town. Uh, but I don't know. It, it's a little, it's a little much, you know, and it isn't. And, and, and sure, you know, what they've been very successful at is taking the idea of architecture and design quality and marketing the hell out of it. And it's, it's a good, you know, look at all the industry and stuff they brought in besides the Millers. I mean, they've been pretty damn successful at it. So it's hard to kind of fault success on one level, you know, uh, because they have made a, you know, a good marketing thing out of it. But uh, in terms of the architectural quality, I mean, you know, forget it. I just is not nirvana. Uh, in my estimations, I. Is there any building you would like? Uh, the Saren, the Saren in Church, you know, I mean, is one of the both father and son are both, you know, exquisite. But the, particularly the original one, I mean, the the one done in the late thirties, what the, the one, I mean, that's one of the great churches in the United States. Anyway, I mean, that is a beautiful building. Um, the uh, and the, and then the the other one by Saren and Junior is pretty damn nice. The. Uh, I mean, we love our little fire station, obviously, because it was one of the first buildings that we really were able to play with symbolism. You know, it is the first one we ever did that with. You know, of, well, of the idea of an ordinary, a very ordinary program, which is what a firehouse is. The ultimate, a firehouse is a garage with some living accommodations. You know, I mean, it's a, the ultimate. And then, you know, to make a civic gesture out of that, it was, I still think it's one of the better buildings we ever did, even if it did have facade problems, the, um, which they've now repaired. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's certainly not terribly well appreciated. You know, if you did a vote on firehouses, the new Art Deco one, I'm sure, would get all the vote. And, you know, it was, it was on the ass end of town when it was built, and it's still on the ass end of town. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's hardly... <laughs> but, it, you know, we've always loved that building. Um, although they, they seem to be kind of re... I mean, it's finally back on the tour, on the architectural tour. <laughs> I guess because Bob's a big name now, they put it back on. But the, uh, and they've actually, we had to write a little thing last year for the tour guide so they could say something about it. <laughs> this, this also in some sense makes us lies because it's very, very Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a fun little thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've got three pieces in my limit. It's <laughs> funny you say that about Columbus and. Everybody in my farm in hometown says, you Columbus had an accent, and it's a big joke. How they try to hide that their bowling lanes are all on the south side. <laughs> <laughs> it really is kind of an ostentation. Yeah. I live in Columbus. It's permeated throughout the architecture and the, you know, the society and everything. It's a showcase. Yeah, well, we made a big mistake a year ago when we started this project, you know, on the gateway. and. Um, that the first charrette, you know, we had these, you know, they're really into this public charrette process down there. It's just like, you know, gospel because of all the years with the CRS people out of Houston, I guess, that ran those things endlessly in Columbus. And so you're put in this kind of mix master public design process, which can be a little weird. And because uh, everybody's an expert in Columbus. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we came up the first night with uh, some. Uh, a lamp design, a lamp pole design going, street light design going to the town that was in the shape of corn cobs. Boy, did we, <laughs> did we catch all the, you know, forget that, you know, I mean, you know we don't have anything to do with corn, you know. I mean, this isn't farm country, what are you talking about? Just because we're surrounded by cornfields, you know, get, don't give me. <laughs> it was definitely a faux pas, you know, to come up with rural symbolism in Columbus. <laughs>
lasted about 10 minutes. <laughs> Actually, I find this interesting what you're saying about uh, how the neighbors look at. Uh, yeah. No, you sense that one here. With an accent. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the role of the architect, I think it's sort of implied what, what you're learning here in school is our environment, our architecture really has a strong impact on, you know, inhabitants or occupants' happiness. Happiness. Um, one of the strongest after the initial siren uh, impact, if we can say so, we had a very strong sponsored program, or still have it, uh, in terms of public schools in Columbus. Right. Uh, as we all know, it yeah, uh, uh, was uh, subsidized uh, uh, the architectural fees by uh, the Architectural Foundation. And, uh, and there are a bunch of really nice schools. As a matter of fact, if you want to study school building of the last 50 years in this country, that's a wonderful case study. And if that's really true, that the environment has an impact on it, it might be nice if we would like to find out you know, how the SAT scores are and how people rank and, and how this compares, say, with Muncie, Indiana, or any other typical city. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I still sort of think that environment has an impact on your mind and happiness and whatever. Until I really read, not too long ago, a study published in Time magazine, a very distinguished research institution, compared SAT scores of these fancy suburban, open plan and whatever schools with inner city schools. The finding was, guess. It's worse in the suburbs because the kids aren't pushed as hard. They don't have to, yeah, they're a little more kicked back because they have less to worry about. Do <laughs> you think that's right? About the same. Yeah. About the same? So the suburban fancy schools are... No, but that's a... And that has nothing to do with it. He is right. Uh, many inner city schools, there's no statistically no significant difference. Right. As a matter of fact, some of the most excellent schools are in what do you call it? You call it shitty buildings? Yeah. Which means really bad buildings. They're ancient. And what makes you know good yeah, but some of those and good students is the spirit of the faculty being able to overcome the difficulties of the space. So that's yeah, but that's like uh, my my kids all grew up in inner city school, all went to inner city schools in Philadelphia, and all the way through. And there were some of the best schools. I mean, you know, they got an okay education, uh, but I mean, architecturally, they were wonderful buildings because they were built. I mean, there's, there's a whole era of school construction in the United States before World War II that was just, you know, wonderful kind of high ceilings, big double hung windows, lots of light, beautiful wood and tile wainscoting. I mean, really wonderful buildings that have stood the test. I mean, you know, and, and while education philosophies have changed, these buildings are really, have worn unbelievably well and are really quite, all right, they're in nitty gritty urban neighborhoods, big deal, you know, and you ride the subway to school, but, uh, and you get mugged once a month, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, a, but, but, you know, as, as an architectural environment, they aren't necessarily a negative. They aren't the classic suburban, you know, open plan schools. Uh, but I have a feeling, you know, I mean, we're starting to think about schools a lot now because we're starting to work on this Edison project, this thing of redesigning the American school system. We're just getting ready to start. And so uh, we're starting to think a lot about <coughs> schools and what makes a good school because this project is going to involve reusing existing schools, totally new schools, and uh, kind of, you know, schools in ad hoc places like in an office building or take over an old defunct shopping center and turn it into a school, you know. Uh, uses like that that are probably going to be pretty relevant in the next 10 years with all the money that everybody's supposedly going to put into education. So. But I think you're right. I mean, having, having grown, having had my kids grow up in a, you know, pretty nitty gritty inner city, it really makes zip difference, um, you know, the environment beyond a certain physical security level, you know, on the, the, the level, what kind of education you're getting. Um, if you've got committed teachers and, uh, you know, a fairly flexible educational policy that, you know, in the schools, you get pretty good results. If you define architecture as, you know, this is a nice place to be as a test for good architecture, how do you feel about, say, the Columbus schools versus any other school? I find, I don't know all of them that well. I find a lot of them 
terribly dated and not very interesting, or, or too interesting in a lot of ways, and very inflexible. I mean, I mean the trouble with that era, the trouble with the Columbus school system is probably is the classic one that they built a lot of schools in that whole kind of open, you know, kind of open plan experimentation era. And I have a feeling those damn buildings are going to blow them up. You know, I mean they're going to be really difficult to to retrofit into something else. The nice thing about the older era of schools was. They were so generous and kind of, you know, in terms of, and simple in their basic layout that you can do all kinds of things with them. You know, you could use all kinds of educational philosophies in those buildings, whereas the, you know, the, all the acoustical problems and other issues with the open plan schools probably makes them a hell of a lot less adaptive um, than the, the earlier era of school. You know, everybody gets so afraid of the idea of an institutional image for schools, and that those older schools had that quality. You know, they're highly repetitive. Um, they weren't quite so assertively architecturally in interesting. There weren't dramatic spaces in them, like there are in some of the, you know, the big atriums and some of the Columbus schools and everything. And um, I just have a feeling they make for a heck of a lot. But they're beautifully detailed, and the materials are good, which you can't say for a lot of, you know, schools done in the 60s and 70s. So. Um, so my guess is now that we're going to be designing some schools, we'll probably start looking awful hard at schools of 50 years ago rather than 20 years ago. You know, and you'd be a hell of a lot less interested in the schools of the last 20 years. See the Simon Wu Hall, they're in the University of Um I think it has that uh, for the pictures. I haven't been to it. But I think you get that quality of detail that, uh, you know, it, it puts you, I think that's a very important building in terms of, of modern architecture uh, with, with a sense of the values of architecture in the years. Yes, that's yes, schools have to be, Denise's favorite line about all academic architecture, whether it's for kindergarten or colleges, it's got to be kickable because schools, buildings take probably as much abuse as almost any kind of, you know, this building <laughs> included, uh, take an immense amount of abuse. I mean, if they're used well, I mean, basically, because you're doing all kinds of things. And so the kind of kickable quality that they age with a patina rather than just look shoddy, you know, over time is, is a kind of key thing with, and that's why a lot of older school buildings are, look rather want mellow, rather, because, you know, you have all those wonderful tongue groove wainscots and everything, which can take all kinds of abuse you know, right down where you, you're up against them and everything. And uh, and so it's it's that quality that you're trying to get. The difficulty with that is it's a relatively expensive quality to get. So I don't know what we'll do now that we have to do a $60 a square foot school. It'll be interesting to see what our theories will. <laughs> yeah, that book you're looking at, that's probably the best book that we've, it's never been published. It was, actually that was done by an intern in the office three years ago from Rice. He put that get together as his student project. He just took 20 years of drawings and took pieces out of them and Xeroxed them and put them by category, you know, trees, cars. It's probably, we ought to market the damn thing. It's got a lot of really good stuff in it. Probably the, the most useful book that we ever. <laughs> and there's like 20 copies of it laying around the office. We use it every day. I mean, people just constantly using it. You just slap the page in the Xerox machine and blow things up and, uh, it's probably one of the more useful things that anybody ever did in the office. Much more useful. That gets used a hell of a lot more than complexity and contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't been opened by anybody in 20 years. <laughs> but that one gets used every day. <laughs> That's our graphic standard. Uh. In your museum project in, in London, uh, did you find, well, did you get much feedback from the people there, are they are they a different culture? Yeah, yeah that's, like, that's putting it politely. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's favorite comment about, I mean, you know, Bob loves English architecture, and he says, you know, I started the job as an Anglophile, and I ended it as an Anglophobe. Uh, <laughs> but it, I mean, he just hates them. I mean, it, it got so bad. I hired as an intern last year a kid from Wales. He almost fired me. I, you know, I, 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 I said, but he's not English. He said, well, you well, know, I don't care. He's from that island. <laughs> he, he just hates them. I mean, they, they put us through such hell. It was, and it isn't, it was the kind of client, you know, remember, uh, 
a national gal. You know, it was being given by a very rich family. You know, the building, and and then you had a very bureaucratic client because the museum is a national part of the national government. You know, so you got it's like working for the Smithsonian here or something, right? So you got this highly bureaucratized client. You have no tradition of like you do in this country of donors, you know, giving architecture. And so there's no tradition of how the client and the donor are going to interact. And so the architect, you know, in, in terms of the process of design, you know, whose building is it? The guy who's paying or the guy who's going to live in it? You know, those kind of arguments. And so you get, and you get caught between, you know, so the architect's caught between the struggling, um, between money and bureaucracy, basically. And, uh, it was an extremely difficult process, which you know we threatened, we quit twice, and yeah, you, know, you know, it just, I mean, it just drove you crazy. I mean, and and kind of irrational. It wasn't a question of making demands. I mean, you know, kind of rational demands and expectations of a client are what you know you're you're paid to deal with every day. You know, and 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 that's what you do. You know, if you got to draw the plan a hundred times to get it the way they want it, you do it. I mean, any responsible architect. But here we're talking, you know, just plain loony bin crazy stuff, you know, people kind of playing out whatever <laughs> weird things going on in their head on you, you know, and and, uh, and that gets extremely difficult for any architect after a point, especially when they're doing things like, just to give you an example, uh, at one point in the detailing of the elevation, they put the detailing of a Corinthian capital up to a committee vote, and, and Bob just looked at him and said, you know, I spent my whole life learning how to do this stuff. And you mean you aren't going to trust me to do this? You know, you're going to put this up. You know more about this than I do. Well, if you do, then you do it. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> screw you. I'm out of here. You know, I mean, I mean, that which is a very different comment from, oh, you want this room bigger and this isn't work? I mean, fine. You know, you're, it's your room. I'm going to make it the way you want it. But when it comes to the detailing of a Corinthian capital, Jesus, you know, why? You know, you're the expert? Okay, you stamped the drawing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of stuff. And they never understood the difference. And then, for an American, it's like, for once, learning what a class society is all about. I mean, okay, we have classes in this country. But we don't have classes the way they got classes. I mean, I mean, you really are, an architect is one step up from, a, you know, from the, the shoemaker uh, in England. I mean, you really are nothing but... In other words, don't speak until you're spoken to. You have no professional standing whatsoever. Professionalism means nothing in that country, especially when you're dealing with all these upper class assholes. I mean, it's basically, you know, they've known each other since they're five years old. You're an outsider, forget it, you know. Come here, you know, sit down, all right, you know, I'll tell you what you're going to do, goodbye. Uh, and so your professional opinion means nothing, you know. I mean, the worst schlock developer over here would give you more respect than those turkeys would. I mean, so. You put all that together for four or five years, and you get people who really hate those bastards. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's all he can do to stop in Heathrow when he has to fly to Europe. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just a practical question. Thank God the revolution went the way it did. <laughs> We'd all be in deep shit. <laughs> the brain drain is with a good reason. Oh. My question is, uh, Steve, you're involved in hiring interns and other people. And if somebody's going out for a job and is applying at your office, what are you looking for? Um, How do you get people hired, Welsh or not? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people, the intern level, we've been doing a lot of intern hiring the last few years. Like we've had Rice people, Rice has a very highly organized intern process, probably the most highly organized one of any school in the country. And they're very good, they, you know, it's been going for, I don't know, 15, 20 years now, and um, they're very adroit at kind of cultivating, quote, the better offices in the country, and then placing their people in a kind of competitive thing within the school, in the offices. And so they tend to give you very good people. We tend to, have always locked down, got some quite good people, and so you always come back next year and ask for somebody next year. And, and but in terms of kind of the kind of people that tend to, get the most out of an internship in our place is people aren't afraid of real long hours because, you know, it's, it's 60, 70, 80 hours a week on average is what tends to happen. I mean, you get paid for every hour. It isn't like 
Peter Eisman where you pay him to work 80 hours a week. We pay 80. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're not that much slave labor. I mean, so it's slave, but at least you're getting paid to be a slave. Uh, the, uh, Peter Eisman is the ultimate with pretension. I mean, he makes his interns pay him. I mean, I think he's Frank Lloyd Wright or something. Uh, <laughs> He used to do that. He's the only other guy who ever got away with that. <laughs> but uh, uh, the people that tend to, you can't be afraid of criticism and pretty, because an office like ours, whatever it does well is basically based on a just constant critical environment. And I don't mean, I don't think we're, it isn't like we're assaulting people personally and, and destroying people's personality. I don't mean personal criticism so much as kind of intellectual and architectural criticism. It's and so, you know, the people that tend to do best in our office, I've watched over time, and when, and when I've hired my own students out of Penn or something, very often the people that kind of got patted on the back from first year right on through whatever year in school, you know, for their studio work, have a tough time when they hit our office because suddenly they aren't the best anymore, you know, and they're just getting shot down every day like everybody else is. And sometimes they find that very hard, you know, the idea that, gee, I didn't get it right, you know, I got to come back tomorrow and do it again. Um, and that, and they can't stand that kind of, you know, critical environment. Very often the people that I've seen do the best are the people who maybe weren't so great in first year, but by third or fourth year they're really starting to get into it. So they've taken a lot of knocks, they aren't afraid of criticism, they get up the next day and try again. And uh, they tend to really blossom and have a great time. Um, and we've had some really good, um, the trouble now is that we've had enough good people in the last few years, we tend to bring them back again and again. You know, like there's one woman from uh, Rice we had a year ago that, you know, will come back now that she's graduated this May, you know, again. And, uh, but it's a, uh, we ought to talk. I mean, you know, this year we, we got a lot of new work. There probably is some opportunity to bring somebody from here for an internship that um, I have to talk to Marvin about setting up some kind of process. The, um, These people are going to graduate, so what do they do if they you know, want to be... Uh, yeah, I, I, the, um, certainly isn't, I mean, like, you know, like, well, like a people who can draw, people who have good CAD skills, I mean, those are kind of baseline, you know, stuff. You know, in an office like ours, just about everybody can draw. Just about everybody now, you know, 80, 90 percent of the office is on CAD all the time, so CAD skills are definitely, yeah. And not just kind of working drawing CAD skills, but kind of rendering CAD skills are way up there now. I mean, you know, because like, like the stuff I'll show this afternoon, every damn drawing is a CAD drawing. There's almost no hand drawings in what you're going to see, you know, in these competitions. It's the only way we can get them out and save our shirts is to basically do them on the computer. So, huh? AutoCAD, you know, at least 11, at least 12. Like yeah, and we are, uh, there aren't only about four or five guys that are good on 3D in the office. Uh, but we're using it more and more. Um, actually, I should have brought down, I've got our latest 3D. I could run upstairs and get it out of there. I've got a, uh, a laser print of one of our, as of two days ago, for the ferry or, you know, 3D thing we're working on, doing some pretty complex full color 3D stuff now. But um, we don't have the computer horsepower to really do it. I mean, that stuff just <laughs> slows you down. To, but we are doing it on one or two things now and then just that, that have the money and the time that, you know, that you can invest in that kind of stuff. Hopefully in a couple of years that'll be a lot quicker and easier to do. The, um, so those are kind of baseline things. Um, kind of just good basic architectural skills is what we're looking for. And I'll tell you, I probably, you know, I just, from having been around here for a month, you people are a hell of a lot farther ahead than the kids from Penn and Yale and Harvard right now. Those, they're unhirable on most of those schools at $20,000 a year. I mean, they just have no skills whatsoever. I don't know what the hell those schools are doing anymore, but it's all theory, all bullshit, and no go. I mean, you know, it's just most of the level of drawing and presentation around here is like six times higher than there is at Penn right now, you know. I haven't hired a Penn student in three or four years. They're unhirable. And they pay them some big bucks to become unhirable. <laughs> so, that's, if it's any, so if that's any consolation, you're... <laughs> you know, one of the very 
spectacular things about the school. I don't know if we have the chance to test this. It's when they shall wear. Because if you take these guys to shall wear, I mean, they can kill anybody. It's unbelievable what they can do. And what you guys can do sometimes in a 12, 24 hour period. Yeah, well, we're definitely looking for charrette animals. That's yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just. From the standpoint yeah. of modeling and getting the work all together, um, I, I sometimes think that there is no place for charrette work like this one. And sometimes that's a bit dangerous also. No? There might be a dangerous side to that, you know, that you get used, that you can do anything. You know, the last yeah, no, it's, <laughs> I, here's the danger. Look, having been through six months of charrettes like that, you know, you, it's kind of, it's like, it's like a roller coaster. I mean, you know, the nice things about charrettes is the, it's like drugs. It's, you know, there's tremendous adrenaline rush and you have all this focus and 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 everybody's kind of hanging together you know really tight and then you have the big depression you know the next three days after where you crash right you know through the floor and then up you come again and yeah and, it, and so it gets to be a terrible yo-yo kind of you know situation and the trouble and it's great for doing competitions and stuff like that it's the only way you can do it you know i mean because it's so insane that if you don't have that kind of esprit but it's a hell of a, it's a lousy way to kind of detail or get a building built. <laughs> so the office is in this, but what happens in the office is that, well, what's happened lately is the younger people, the interns, get kind of chewed up as charrette animals, right? And the older people kind of sit back and, uh, except for me, who still thinks he's 25 and doing charrettes, but the... Uh, <laughs> The, most of the older guys are kind of producing buildings, you know, which is a, you, you, you can't do on that kind of craziness that goes into, you know, charrettes. It's done in a much more, you know, eight or ten hours a day in, in a regular sort of way. Otherwise, you just, you're just going to make too many mistakes. You're just going to screw up in a complex building. And we've got some big complex jobs now. So I don't know. I, you know, so it's hard to know what people... My guess is for the next two years, there'll be less charrette psychosis in our office and more kind of the grind because, you know, and that's the cycle. I mean, back four or five years ago when Seattle Art Museum National Gallery and production, God, there were, you know, 25 people each on each of those jobs. And they were stuck on them for two years. You know, you just ground away on those things. And uh, it was a real slog on uh, anything but charrette psychology. Now we've just got one a whole bunch of competitions and gone through so I guess we're looking at more of a slog again. So, you know, there's these cycles in an office like ours where you got the work, you start to slog it, you know, in order to produce a quality thing and keep control of it. Getting the work is, you know, having fun and doing charrettes. <laughs> Some people think it's fun. <laughs> I have one question. You as Denise and Bob like to use the vernacular architecture, uh, but you mix it with the modern architecture. So what I what I think is that that is postmodern. Why you don't accept uh, what you doesn't accept what your architecture is postmodern? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the last part of it. Repeat it one more time. I say, uh, you mix the the modern with the historical. <clears throat> so that is what is postmodern. Postmodern. Oh, oh, it's postmodern. Yeah, we don't consider ourselves postmodern. So that's, right. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a really nasty word. <laughs> you don't use that word in our office. Um, the um, I the difference is, look, Bob considers himself a modern architect, and the the, the superficiality of I mean, look, the, the superficial most a lot of things that are done under the name of postmodern are just lousy, right? I mean, they're they're superficial. It's kind of pastiche. It's not very well considered, and it's just kind of like postage stamp architecture. And and we don't think that we do it that way. You know, when we deal with these, in other words, if you look at most of our buildings in plan or you know the way they work and the way they're stri they're basically modern buildings. They're not you know they're not some ripped off Georgian building that Stern turns out or something. You know, it, it's they're, they're buildings that have because of their detailing and their scale and, and some of their symbolic uh, imagery have associations because of their context of very often just historical points but, and, and issues. But, but you're never mistaken when you look at them that this is, you know, 
1780 historic, you know, Georgian building. You know the difference, you know, with, with even an unsophisticated person is pretty much going to know the difference, you know. And, and that's very conscious because we're not interested in doing historical recreation, you know, in, in any kind of literal sense. Even something like the National Gallery, you know, which has some very literal historicism in one piece of it, it's put together in a very inappropriate and, quote, wrong way in terms of classical vocabulary. You know, it, it, it breaks all kinds of rules. Uh, just as, you know, 18th century English classicism broke the 16th century classical rules. You know, I mean, it, it, so that we're kind of more interested in the adaptation of historic styles and symbols, uh, but always to the late 20th century, not to, you know, not to just kind of sticking it on or something. Um, and, you know, and, and Bob is basically a class, Bob spends most of his time being a good functional architect, any kind of responsible architect. I mean, we end up spending in a discussion like this talking a lot about imagery and symbol, but, you know, what you do every day is make plans work. I mean, that's where 90% of all architecture is, is in the plan, right? I mean, that's the solution to the problem, more often than not, is solving the plan. And that's what we spend 90% of our time on, and, you know, but it's kind of, you know, that's so ordinary, it's hard to, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that. But, you know, probably the best, if you want to learn something the most from our architecture, just look at all our plans. There's more to learn from them than there probably is, you know, anything to do with elevation or symbol, even though that's an interesting I issue. Had, and, I had a question with that. Um, is there anything unique to Venturi Scott Brown in, um, in the in interior of, like, your best projects and things like that? Because whenever I see it, I always see the outside, the imagery on the outside, but I never get to hear about what goes on in the inside. Any unique? Well, I mean, our buildings tend to be relatively undramatic on the interior because, you know, we don't tend to do grand spaces and stuff like that, except, you know, this, the Staten Island Fairly Terminal is probably the biggest, most dramatic space we've worked on in years. The, um, because, you know, most of our buildings are kind of highly repetitive institutional buildings, you know. 50 offices, 30 labs. Yeah, I mean, they're this kind of, this like the building we're in. They're these highly cellular, you know, highly repetitive, double-loaded buildings. I mean, you know. Um, and so it really does have to do with kind of fairly simple, straightforward plans that very often have a little spin on them in, you know, public spaces or, you know, at the ends of halls or lobbies or something, but but not usually in a very undramatic in section. Uh, and then a lot of very careful facade massaging and detailing, you know, to give a kind of richness and scale, but usually in fairly subtle ways, you know, not in any super dramatic, not very much in the way of sage and shadows and, and exteriors, more in terms of pattern and color and decoration. The, um, I mean, you know, the most dramatic spaces we've done in recent years are the stair halls of Seattle and the National Gallery. I mean, that was the only kind of big whiz bang, quote unquote, spaces we've done in a lot of years were those two things. Because it was inappropriate. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of Bob's thing. Bob is, if anything, if Bob's greatest skill as far as having been around him for years is his ability to edit and throw good ideas away. You know, I mean, that, that goes further to making good architecture as far as I can see. Because when you come right down to it, after you're beyond a certain point in your architectural education, you can, you know, you've got a lot of things stored up. There's, you, you've got more than one way of approaching things, or you know, uh, you've got more than one idea in your head. I mean, it doesn't seem like it when you're in the first couple of years of school. It's hard enough to get the first idea in your head, but at some point you begin to have a kind of store of things, and at that point, it's your ability to edit and select. You know, so it's his ability to throw out uh, all kinds of, you know, responses which aren't quite right or don't fit the context and still come up with another bunch beyond that, you know, so he's not devoid of yet another way to, you know, to deal with the situation. Um, so you can't know too much is the admonition and then you can't edit too little. <laughs> I have a question about your, your experience in Japan. And as, as, you know, compared to the one in England and also know how you adjusted to, to yeah work there. well just as a as a culture it's it's a lot of, for for a group of people who work 7 days a week 12 hours a day japan is nirvana right cuz they're the only place i mean the way you score we the, the first month on the job 
we, you know, we, we, we beat them into the ground because we work longer hours. It, it, it's like, can you send more faxes? Can you send faxes seven days a week to prove that you were? <laughs> and, and the minute you can do that, you score. You know, hey, you know, and, and their big compliment to us was, next to the German, you guys are the hardest working guys. <laughs> And so right off, you're, you got a leg up. Uh, the, uh, because there is this insane, you get this feeling the whole culture is going to have a collective nervous breakdown and just go <laughs> down the, <laughs> I mean, they are crazy. I mean, they're just crazy. Uh, but you can't, the, um, the cultural thing is really fascinating because they have this immense cultural chip on their shoulder, you know, because it, it's a culture that has an absolute genius it recombine, but taking from other places and recombining and making something totally new out of it, which in a sense is the great virtue of American culture. I mean, you know, almost everything that came here except Native Americans was from someplace else and has been, you know, redone by us to create something that isn't still part of where it came from, but it's still something else. Uh, and the Japanese are the same kind of culture, and and they've done it with absolute genius, but they have this tremendous chip on their shoulder of, well, it isn't, you know, we've never done anything original or something. And so Bob wrote the essay in that book is basically saying, look, you know, the genius, you know, you're, this is, the image of Tokyo is truly the image of the 21st century urban environment. I mean, it is the ultimate decon environment. I mean, this kind of unbelievable layering of stuff and information and you know it's it's beyond compare i mean there's nothing like it if new york was the late 19th early 20th century you know image <coughs> of the industrial revolution or whatever you know uh, tokyo has got to be the image of the you know the 21st yeah yeah it's 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 all that put together i mean it's just it's unbelievable it's it's really quite Actually, that, that brings me to to one last that's not a question but a comment uh, looking at uh, the mm. clock, I know, I know. Japan is a key work because our distinguished professor needs to work with his students yeah, right. uh, down in room 219. And uh, I can thank just you. say, thank you. Uh, you know, it's really great that you invite me. No, thank you. Very and uh, you, uh, <laughs> you give him a big hand? Yeah, yeah. Sure. You're not going to use that tape.